Hi, uh, good afternoon. Welcome to everybody. Bienvenue à cette conférence en recherche chaque semaine. And uh, just uh, uh, a few uh, logistics uh, before uh, I think our really exciting and uh, 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 futuristic uh, talk today uh, from Dr. Emilio Arlacan. And uh, so just remember that uh, you can pose your questions throughout the lecture using the Q&A feature on the bottom of your screen. And we'll answer those questions uh, in turn as the, uh, the uh, lecture concludes. And you can also raise your hand and so you can then pose the question directly and we'll bring you into the uh, chat uh, and uh, the uh, Q&A uh, in a live setting. And, uh, but if you have any technical problems, you know, please use the chat function and uh, Kelsey or Allison will be able to get you uh, uh, linked in without problems. And so it's an absolute delight today that we uh, feature uh, one of our uh, star researchers, uh, Dr. Emilio Arlacan. And uh, he's a scientist in the Division of Cardiac Surgery and Director of Biomed Nanomaterials in the Engineering Laboratory here at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. He's also Associate Professor in the Department of Biochemistry, Microbiology, and uh, Immunology uh, in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Ottawa. And uh, Dr. Arlacan was born uh, in Santiago, Chile, which is a beautiful city. And in 2005, received his BSc in chemistry under the supervision of Professor Arvardo Lisi at the University of Santiago, the Chile. And uh, at that time, he was exploring the chemiluminescent uh, mechanisms of tryptophan oxidation. And uh, thereafter, Dr. Arlacan moved to Pontifica Universidad Católica de Chile to pursue as a graduate studies. And I should mention that that is a, a super top university in Chile and uh, uh, worldwide as well. And so he received his MSc in chemistry uh, in 2008. And one year later uh, in a PhD uh, in chemistry was a dissertation on oxidative uh, mechanism of proteins mediated by uh, reactive oxygen species. And then Dr. Arlacan moved to Ottawa and uh, to start a postdoctoral fellowship uh, with uh, Dr. Uh, Tito Scanano uh, in the Department of uh, Chemistry at the University of Ottawa. And there he uh, explored the development of new bio nanomaterials and uh, both uh, for health uh, uh, treatment applications as well as biosensors. And uh, certainly we had a lot of, you know, very exciting discussions on various uh, uh, opportunities for collaboration. And he was uh, recruited to the Heart Institute 2014. And uh, the research since that time has been nothing but uh, momentous and amazing. The research is focused uh, on the fabrication, development, and the implementation of new materials uh, with the regenerative uh, capabilities for tissue regeneration repair for the heart, skin, soft tissues, and uh, many uh, more additional uh, applications. And his work is always uh, on the uh, cutting edge. And uh, so these materials can not only uh, promote uh, repair of tissues, but they can also conduct electricity. And uh, nowadays uh, can also heal uh, without the scar. And so it's really uh, very much uh, on the um, uh, front uh, wave of this uh, whole field. And, uh, but on the other hand, Dr. Arlacan also applies this technology to solve uh, uh, problems on the dime. You know, for example, during the early days of the pandemic, when we actually were short of N95 masks, Dr. Arlacan's uh, laboratory immediately developed a perfect uh, a solution uh, using um, refashioned, uh, uh, you know, materials from his lab, and uh, was able to actually get the protocol approved by Health Canada on a rapid basis, and uh, had the result published in scientific reports in just a few months. And it really actually illustrates, uh, you know, the ability to solve problems uh, really through innovation. And he has to date published over eighty three articles in peer-reviewed journals, and he's edited two books as well, and the books are on regenerative medicine and nanomaterials, and really, again, really exciting and cutting-edge area. He's a, a, also associate editor for the journal Frontiers in Biomaterials, 
And this lab is currently funded by NSERC, uh, uh, CIHR, and, uh, but also very importantly, the NSERC Collaborative Research uh, Program, which is the CHIRP program, you know, very, very competitive. And also New Frontier uh, Research Fund, again, extremely competitive, but also underscores the innovation. And most recently, he's, he's won a number of awards, but most recently he won the Nano uh, Ontario Award for Outstanding Early Career Achievements in Nanoscience and Nanotechnology, and he will deliver the award lecture on March the 17th. And so you can see that this is really an exceptional uh, journey of uh, research Dr. Arlecon has undertaken, and this is but just a small fraction of uh, what he does. And uh, today we really look forward to another very exciting uh, topic, nano painting of an infarct heart. Take it away, uh, Emilio. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Can, can you can you see me? Can you hear me? Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. And um, you know, like uh, it's been actually over seven years since the moment uh, you know Eric, Mark, and, and you recruit me with the support, of course, of the foundation and everyone. And I have only words of thank you and for giving the opportunity. And uh, today's talk is going to be a little bit about uh, how curiosity can actually drive drive in innovation, and uh, if we can call it innovation. This is, uh, the slides were designed by Irene Guzman, uh, as uh, she's part of my team, and um, she actually found this uh, emoticon in, around there, and, and she said that it really looks like me, and I'm totally actually 100% for that. <laughs> and so I'm trying to, you know, preserve my little mustaches, if you can call it like that. So then a painting of broken heart is a, is a tale of curiosity, and, and somehow, to walk you through the process of how um, you can merge engineering, material design, chemistry, and uh, surgical procedures to, to come up with the potential new solutions for the cardiovascular diseases. Uh, I'm part of, of BIT. BIT is the Bioengineering and Therapeutic Solution Labs. Um, this is an acronym that Dr. Suronan came up with. And this video is somehow uh, intended to illustrate what we do in the lab. and. Um, if you can hear the audio, this is original actually soundtrack from the Dr. Suranen's uh, Miss Pan. It's a uh, beautiful. <laughs> I highly recommend you. And uh, there are more information in our website. And what we do is uh, we're integrated lab. Uh, we are intrinsically multicultural and um, inclusive at the same time. Um, we are really proud of how we are able to structure this innovation together with uh, with taking into account all the, the different views. You know, to solve and real problems, you need to really have more than with discipline and, and this is something that we do uh, fairly well at the in the team i'm really proud of that so something we're all very familiar with one way or another you know we work at the university of Ohio higher institute of course um is that the problem we still have is cardiovascular diseases are the leading cause um, and mortality worldwide this is from the stats we have available, of course. So, and developing countries, you know, like places in South America, they don't even actually keep tra track record of all these things. And many patients, they, they live a long life with, the, with cardiovascular diseases. They don't have access to healthcare. So the numbers probably are, are worse than this. But in Canada, particularly over half a million Canadians are living with the advanced health failure. That uh, is, um, we know that um, he, the prognosis is not good. So when I was recruited by the Harry Institute and uh, I had the, the opportunity of being, uh, still being mentored actually by Eric and, and Mark, of course, um, uh, we set it up um, a goal. And the goal is was developing translational uh, therapies for cardiovascular disease for treating these damaged hearts. Uh, so in the process of learning from, you know, a heart physiology all the way to um, how to <laughs> deliver these therapies has been actually truly an, an endeavor of, of of relearning everything. You know, I'm a chemist. I was trained as an industrial chemist for flotation, lixiviation, and everything that you can imagine for minerals. Mm -hmm. um, then I learned protein chemistry and I became a little bit of in the middle in, in nanotechnology. So uh, the journey has been not uh, easy. I mean, like many, many years of work since 2014. And uh, we were fortunate in uh, developing this injectable material that technically you deliver is based on type one collagen. 
So um, recombinant human collagen, so you inject it with the, the infarct area in the border zone of the infarct area. And what you can see here is the recombinant type one collagen improves the cardiac function in this you know, a small animal model of myocardial infarction. Compared to the PBS that you can clearly see a decline. There is another type of the type of uh, collagen, which is type, type three collagen that is basically stabilized function after. So we published this in 2019 and in 2020, uh, Eric, um, of course, Eric and I, that always Eric, you know, leading this, the biology part and more the materials guy, of course, um, we, we reported that injecting more is no better, right? So we learned from here is that we can inject it and the heart, it does better, but if you're injecting more of the type three collagen, that is the one that is being integrated very quickly, it doesn't actually do much better. So injecting more is not better. So when we reach at this point with Eric and um, with the team, we start questioning, we start wondering how, how does it work? You know, do we really need the full length collagen? Can we do the same with the small uh, minimalistic point of view, like a minim minimalistic approach of using peptides, the small building blocks, something that we can do, right? So um, last year, um, no, two years ago, before the pandemic, uh, okay, this is before pandemic times. Uh, we established a collaboration with uh, Dr. Peggy Angel in North Carolina University, South Carolina University, and uh, she is uh, one of the leaders worldwide in in advanced uh, proteomics and you know and mass spectrometry uh, in imaging mass spectrometry. So what we did basically we sent her the different slides of of the tissues that were actually being recovered and you know having some regain in the cardiac function and what. Uh, she did with the help of our advanced peptide synthesis services we have in here at the Heart Institute, uh, led by, by Ben and I, Benjamin Rostein and I. Basically, what she did was able to map where the different uh, differential protein uh, peptides were expressed. And this is not a, ma a minor finding. Basically, what she's kind of like thousands of different candidate peptides. She did, was able to differentiate what was coming from the animal that was coming from the actual collagen we injected in here in this study. Uh, and we published that uh, last year. It's, it's gaining a lot of momentum. This Journal of American Society Mass Spectrometry is a really top leading journal uh, for the mass people. And it's a good example of how we can to really use uh, imaging mass spec to uh, identify new candidate drugs. So we have now five or seven different peptides we are testing in the lab, and I want to tell you about that today. But these peptides are derived from the collagen we're injecting, and they do seem to have actually some uh, really powerful biological activity, particularly proangiogenic and, and, and helping the cells to differentiate better. So, so we were actually puzzled with that. So now we like we, we say, okay, let's try to use peptides. Okay, let, let's try to start moving to peptides. So a couple of years ago with Ben, Erin, and, and many other applicants, we were, we were able to secure some RTI funding from NSERC. So we have a peptide synthesis facilities and, and Ben is certainly actually pitching in <laughs> everything that is from, uh, you know, like the mass spec system and, and also helping us with all the characterization. Of course, Dr. Marcelo Munoz has been instrumental to, to set it up these facilities and having it up and running. But before that, in 2017, 2016, um, I had the opportunity of co-supervise Dr. Katsuhiro Soyama with, uh, with Eric Suronen. And um, it was a wonderful experience because I learned so much from Katsuhiro, uh, surgical techniques and everything. But one of the things that we learned with Katsuhiro is that implanting cardiac patches, if you want to implant a cardiac patch, is not a trivial thing in a animal model. So the surgical field is small, the, the materials, you have to suture them and glue them. So the data we were actually obtaining, it was good, of course. In this particular case, what we did, we developed this hybrid material that is a sandwich, right? On the surface, you have the fibers with this nano electric conductive gold. So we, we, are, we were putting gold in there, nano gold on the fibers, collagen fibers, and then, but before implantation, you have to sandwich it in a, with a hydrogel, so it's elastic. And Katsuhiro spent like probably 18 months just optimizing the surgical procedure plus what hydrogel you're gonna actually use it for sandwich. It was uh, painful and we obtained a nice publication as actually gaining a lot of attention from the, in the field. And basically what we found is that you can improve the ejection fraction when you are using the combination of everything. So you have to have the nano gold, which is electroconductive, 
the collagen fibers plus the sandwich, which is the, which is the, you know, the, the hydrogel. So you are improving the cardiac function in this animal model that uh, after seven days of MI. But, uh, but it's difficult. I mean, it is difficult and cardiac patch implantation is not trivial. And this is one example. There are many examples, you know, groups in Toronto, uh, you know, some terrorist group and uh, mainly just two and in Toronto two that have been doing that for, for decades. And it is challenging. The surgical procedure is challenging itself. So um, in discussions with Chala and, and Marcelo, we, we, we acknowledge this. And of course with Eric as well, it is a difficult procedure, right? And it's not alone. I mean, injecting also is invasive. So I mean, you're perforating the, the, the muscle and it can induce some inflammation as well after the injection, that's true. The cardiac patch implantation is challenging. We are aware of that. It's not easy. I mean, it sounds easy when you are the PI and you're not doing the surgery, but it is easy. The struggles are real. And so we would sit down and say, how can we do this better, faster, and more interesting, right? From a point of view of, of designing a new, a new approach to do it. So of course you have many ways to do it. And uh, this is two years of research summarizing one slide. And basically what we came up with, it was, the idea was simple. It was originally a proof of concept. We said like, how about we spray directly on the heart and you see how it goes. But the spray process is not a trivial one. So you have to, first of all, design this device it has to be miniaturized to provide you a nice and uniform spraying pattern. And on top of that, the goal, we know that if you spray directly, it's gonna be used, you know, ended up in off target different organs. So we had to assign peptide structures that when were attached it to the cardiac muscle, they will be chemically you know, bonded there. So we have to do chemistry, we have to do peptide design, we have to do engineering design, and of course the surgical procedure. So we ended up finding that uh, in here, so 35 days after the myocardial infarction or 28 days after the treatment, we're using seven days uh, time point after the MI as a clinical relevant uh, time point for applying the treatment. We found that we improved the cardiac function and somehow improved electrical conductivity within the cardiac muscle. So this is, when we started this, it was the, before the pandemic, of course, and it was one of the projects that actually really kept the lab uh, together, <laughs> alive during the pandemic, because we have so much data to analyze, we have so many things to actually rethink about it. And today, hopefully I'm gonna be able to present you is to the level that uh, Marcelo and Shala would like to see it. Many more actually involved, including collaborators within the Heart Institute, you will see. So the first part is the surface engineering, right? This is what we do in my lab, you know, like the guys they do it perfectly fine. So they're fantastic at doing this. The protocol is fairly straightforward. So we made the particles in 30 minutes, then we have to add the peptides and we uh, analyze this in terms of isothermal titration calorimetry to get thermodynamic data dynamic light scattering to see what the effect on the size is, and plasmon band. Plasmon band is basically the absorption of the different nanoparticles that we have. In this case, it's used nanogold. And here's when the engineer, well, the chemistry and somehow the engineering comes into, into action. So this is all peptide synthesized by, by Marcelo and many of the students actually were part of the publication that is under review. And you can see here that the engineering is it comes by using the terminal cysteines, right? So trying to have these anchoring arms. So we started in 2015 to engineer this with the one leg, and now we are all the way to the four legs are even more complex. And the concentrations you have in here are the concentrations you need to stabilize the particles. The stabilization was defined as the ability of the particles to withstand the uh, you know, ionic strength, high temperatures, and stability over a week or so. So as you can see here, you can go from 150 micromolar to the millimolar range to three micromolar. But the beauty of using the approach of the spray on is that we want to spray really low quantities. Like when you're nano painting, when you're painting with the spray, you're, you're having, 
you have to use really a small quantities to cover a large surface area. So in our particular case of the nanoparticles, we're going to use nanomolar, 90 nanomolar in concentration of the nanoparticles. So we want to have a concentration of, of, of the peptide really, really low. So when we reach to this point, uh, Marcel said that we cannot really do it better, right? So if, if we are really pretty much touching the point that synthetically speaking, it's, it's really challenging. So then we start collaborating with Dr. Horacio Poblet, Poblet at the University of Italia in Chile. And um, Horacio was able to do this modeling to actually uh, use a much more complex approach that those are the Marcellus peptides and they're multi arm structures, so more flexible to give them more flexibility. And the beauty of this is that um, you will have a lot of, uh, you know, like aiming groups exposed out, you know, pointing out to be available to, to actually interact with the cardiac muscle. So that is the chemistry we we're looking for. When we design the peptides, particularly the multi two, uh, we were looking to have a lot of these amines pointing out so they would react with the carboxylic acids present in the, in the cardiac muscle. So, and when we identify this peptide, uh, you can see that the concentration you need to stabilize it is really low, it's 0 0.5 micromolar. And this concentration is even lower than the concentration you will need to stabilize nano skull with, uh, with proteins. So this is acceptably synthetically challenging, really challenging. And, uh, and here, the, you know, Marcelo and, and Ben, they were instrumental to get to this point, uh, but it's fairly actually uh, effective and it's highly effective. So then it comes to the point to optimize the spray on device. The spray on device was an engineering beauty uh, uh, developed by Maxim in my lab and, and two summer students. And of course, with the input of everyone else, and this is a really tiny uh, spray, uh, spray system. We call it the nozzle, really tiny, two centimeters. Um, and the chemistry we used, it was fairly simple. It was uh, EDC and HS, but the EDC and HS concentration we're using is the micromolar. And even, yeah, I, I will say that even the sub micromolar when we're doing the numbers. So that is excellent because you're using four microliters. We're loading with only four microliters again, four microliters with micromolar concentration. So technically you are delivering really, really low quantities of, of the compounds. So, and you have the pepper solution, you add the nanoparticle, you mix it. And when you mix it, you add a little bit of the ADC NHS and you load the gun, man, that's it, you spray it. So now we have to, of course, optimize it. Remember that I was mentioning to you that we have to have a homogeneous pattern. And what we did, we put the nozzle at different distances from the target. So four centimeters, two centimeters, and one centimeter. And you can see here that the one centimeter one is the one giving you a really nice diameter coating. And uh, when you are, again, investigating this, you should give you an example. Uh, what happened, because you know the gold is kind of pinkish, so with no spray, you see no absorption, there is no color. And when you spray, you start seeing the plasma absorption in there. And just to give you an example, this is with the spray and this is with no the spray. And you can see the pattern in there covered. So the coding is, is happening. The coding was possible to be made using this non-engineered peptide. And, and the chemistry we're using a really low concentration. So everything was pointing that, okay, so I mean, like we're doing this, um, let's see how it works. Of course, before doing the in vivo, we did a lot of in vitro, so, but I'm not showing this in here in benefit of the time. And the cells are doing fine, you know, they're happy, they're just proliferating fairly well. So the animal model, again, this is uh, here it's uh, input, of course. So we induce the MI after seven days, we do the, we open chest and we do the, the spray on and we monitor up to 28 days. This is a little bit of how actually the gun looks like. This is the, the spray on system and this is the open chest, it's the ventricle and you have roughly one centimeter uh, to, to the actual cardiac muscle to the left ventricle. So what happened? So in here you will see the multi, that's the one you have to be worried about. We also use the four legs that is supposed to be the previous generation and with the goal, AUMP means the goal and the particles in there. So you can see here that only the multi was able to improve the cardiac function in terms of LV ejection fraction compared to the other groups, okay? Uh, this is our box plot. So we have a sample size that is adequate to do all the ANOVA comparisons, so, but you can clearly see that. 
Now in terms of the muscle contraction, so uh, we use the longitudinal strain analysis. And again, only the, the multi is able to reach values. These values in here are the one that you will find in terms of the contractility of the sham group. So uh, that uh, the multi is different to all the others. It's much superior in terms of contractility and is close to what you will find in the shams. So that was really interesting. And certainly, to be honest with you, was unexpected. We were expecting this use to stabilize the heart, but for some reason, it was working really well. So when we reached this point, of course, we went to see Dario and say we have to use some you know, super cool ECG data. It, EGG, and um, we did this, and with Dario's <laughs> guidance and supervision, of course, uh, we found this. It was, again, really puzzling at the time of when you're looking at the, <laughs> at the let's say, you can really see here that the, the sham is pretty much overlapping to somehow with the multi uh, treatment. Uh, this is after 28 days. So it's fairly interesting. In all honesty, it doesn't happen right away. Um, we have data every time points it. We don't really see that. We see a lot of arrhythmia, but still at 28 days and point, you can really see a better in terms of behavior, in terms of the, the conductivity. And um, we bet sure, well, Marcelo and Chala, they did a lot of data processing under the you know, guidelines and uh, guidance. And it was really a massive amount of work. Um, and of data processing. And basically what they found is the QRS interval is reduced only for the multi uh, compared to the other experimental groups with values again, somehow close to the, what you will find in the sham in a healthy animal. That was interesting, right? So, I mean, like, imagine you are just spraying this and the spray takes so quickly. I mean, it takes like less than 10 seconds is, is all what you need to do before you have to actually have to put the patch, you have to manufacture the patch, put the patch, suture the patch, glue it and close it. And in here is you open the chest, you locate the infant area, you spray it and then you close it and that's it. Of course, you have to actually open the pericardium just to, to get a nice spray, but, uh, but it happens. I mean, it happens so, 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 so quickly that this is certainly a technological improvement. So, but as everything, nothing is perfect. And we were fully aware of that. And of course, after you spray this nano gold, which is gold encapsulated and, and you know, forming these spheres, nanospheres, it can, you know, go off target to into different organs. So we did this and you have to follow me here. So you have, the one you have to be worried about is this one versus this one in here. This is the multi with the gold. And this is you, the goal alone, alone. So what you will see here is that we collected the different uh, 28 days, we collected the organs and we separated remote in remote area of the left ventricle, the heart and the left ventricle itself. So with the left ventricle itself only, we see that there is a lot more accumulation of gold. So the goal, the goal is being retained, which is what you were expecting if the chemistry was happening and everything was just on the heart, on the cardiac muscle. Um, the remote, you see some trends of when the gold is alone, it's just, you know, just increasing there, it's just dispersing, which is fine, but it's not statistically significant. Now, when you are looking into the lymph nodes, that is the one that now we're going to be looking at, you will see that both in the case of the four legs and in the case of the multi, you will see that there is pretty much nothing in the lymph nodes compared to the gold alone. And that makes sense to what the literature is reporting that the off-target of gold, unprotected gold nanoparticles, they ended up in the lymph node, they ended up in the kidney. But overall, we can say from this data that our technology using the multi-arm approach compared to previous generations, the four legs, what we call it, peptide engineering, is superior at retaining the gold on the cardiac muscle where we actually will apply it. And we are not sure where it's located, but we know that it's, it's there. So um, in terms of the infrared size, of course, as you can expect it, and the kind of function is better, right? So I mean, like uh, it makes sense to have a, a very reduced uh, infrared size compared to all the experimental groups, uh, which, is, which is really, really exciting. And again, everything was pointed that there's something in here that is happening at the biological level. It's not only like use, you know, an observation of uh, improvement in cardiac function without having any happening in the actual biology. 
So um, again, this was a lot of Shala's work, of course, during the staining with the help of many, many trainees in the team. And uh, what we observe in here, which is interesting for, for us to pay attention to, now we're comparing the multi with the sham. That was a request from one of the, the reviewers, of course, uh, as you can imagine. Um, so when you're comparing the multi, a gold nanoparticle with the sham, you can see that, um, you know, there is nothing, the, the number of capillaries are not reaching significance, but they're you know, somehow overlapping. But uh, when you're comparing the multi with all the other groups, they are you know, certainly statistically either higher in the capillaries or higher in the number of artery also. Uh, it seems to be that it, it, within the infarct, there is somehow better you know, perfusion of blood. There's growing the blood in, growth, blood in there, which comes along with, uh, with okay, the, the heart is function better. So we have to have some better vascularization. Now, in terms of, uh, of macrophages, that is something that we're also interested in. Um, the number of macrophages uh, in the, the prohealing macrophages for the multi, which are the C206, are higher compared to all the experimental groups. And they are somehow, um, they're at 0 0.002 compared to the sham. So that, that's okay, but it's still there is somehow a more prohealing environment. And that is, you know, it comes along well with the reduced number of CD86, the pro, you know, pro-inflammatory macrophages market that we're looking into. And particularly in the case of the, the, the CD86 macrophages, positive macrophages, you can really see that the p-value are comparable between the multi and the sham. So the levels are really low, normally what you will find in a healthy and in a healthy tissue. Again, so everything was pointed towards that. I mean, like things are looking fine. I mean, the, the heart is working better. And um, how does it work? Um, we don't really know yet. Uh, we have data in terms of, uh, of connexin 43, that the connexin 43 numbers are increasing in animals treated with the multi nanoparticles. Uh, we have um, data also in terms of, uh, of troponin that is also increased for the, for the multi uh, nanoparticles treated animals. But uh, we are looking into this, not in terms of the mechanism, because it will take us another four or five years. But we believe that there is a synergistic effect between the peptide, that the peptide is positively charged, it could be actually be incorporated more easily within the cardiac muscle. And at the same time is retaining the nano world within the cardiac muscle in a, in a preventing the aggregation and preventing that to be oxidized. So it's, it's a nice coding, but at the same time it's attaching that. But also it could be that the retaining the gold within the cardiac muscle is somehow reducing the oxidative stress levels that we are observing in the animals, in the cardiac muscle, in the, in, in the infarcted tissue, that it could be something related to prevention, uh, preventing the formation of uh, advanced oxidative products, like something that Dr. Surani has been studying, uh, recently published uh, last year. Um, so, uh, there are a, a gamma of possibilities in here. But in our case, we were fairly interested in how a simple approach, which in reality, when you're comparing to the implantation, to the injection, with the exception of the open chest surgery, of course, it can really lead you to, to have this. You know, we have to engineer the material, of course, we have to engineer the peptide, finding the optimal conditions, you know, doing uh, tons of work in that, in that, in that realm. But at the end of the day, we're able to develop this technology that when you apply it, it's faster, it's technically cheaper. It might not be fully translatable to humans because, you know, electrical conductivity in the cardiac and the, the heart muscle of a human, it happens different than in a, in a mouse. But, but in any case, I think that it has value in terms of we set it or, uh, ourselves to, to solve this problem in a faster and an easier way after seeing all these travels that Katsuhiro actually had to endure over two or three years working with us. So this is of course not the only thing you're working in the team. So we're working a lot on peptides as you can imagine. So we're truly really working hard on peptides uh, for soft tissue and organ on the spot. We're working on the spot technologies. We don't want to actually manufacture things outside. We want to on a spot repair. And uh, we're thinking about bioprinting. We're working a lot on that. The activity material for skin and cornea repair is something that uh, we're also working on. We are working with a group in Montreal and in the skin, we are hopefully having a paper published very soon. 
Um, we uh, do a lot of 3D printed uh, devices uh, uh, for ex vivo models, in this case of biofilm, we're working on cornea, but uh, hopefully we can expand it to skin and different even cardiac models of biofilm formation. And um, this is a project led by, you know, Marcelo on the spot bioprinting of blood vessels for, you know, through Oracle, really ambitious project and with the collaboration of Eric and, and Dr. Well as well. So we, I don't want to actually leave without just giving a little bit of, uh, of an update on, on two projects we have uh, running through bits, which is one is Bit Radio, and we are in our third year. This is episode 101. <laughs> And uh, we are always looking for uh, PIs who want to actually share what they do in different languages. We run in English, French, Spanish, Mandarin, uh, Arabic, and, and Portuguese. So if, if you are a PI, particularly young PI, want to share what you do, your experience, so please send me an email. I'm more than happy to set it up an interview with one of those hosts in any language you speak, as long as we have a host. And uh, last year we launched this uh, curiosity capsules. They are, you know, like a science communication endeavor dedicated uh, for, you know, spreading the world on, on innovation and technology by women in Canada or around the world from uh, underrepresented minorities, immigrants, or, you know, like uh, particularly women in STEM engineering. So um, again, this is something that uh, uh, run through volunteers and the one doing the, all the video editing, but the volunteers are just fantastic. I'd really like to have them on board with the support of the Heart Institute and the Department of uh, Biochemistry, Microbiology and Immunology. So again, if you want to be part of this, you send me an email, I'm more than happy to set up an interview. And uh, I wish I had a picture of the team, but we don't have any pictures. Last picture we have in person was two, two and a half years ago. I don't like the Zoom pictures because I think we all had enough of Zoom for some time, but I uh, used to thank everyone and I'm involved in this. So maybe I missed some names and not really good with names, but particularly, you know, the constant support from the Hari Institute and all my collaborators within the building and the students. I mean, they've known everything, you know, Marcelo, Shala, Maxime, Alex, and, and everyone, Aidan. So, so, so many names. And, um, and I don't want to say them all because probably I forget someone. And I will be happy to try to answer your questions because I cannot certain that they're gonna answer all your questions. Well, thank you so much, Emilio. Fantastic uh, presentation. You know, as always, uh, very forward looking, amazing results. Uh, uh, you know, that's uh, always the uh, uh, impressive aspects. And uh, thanks very much also for the uh, doing the Beats Radio, you know, amongst so many uh, different things you do. You know, this is one that uh, really reaches a very, very broad audience. You know, it's truly a, knowledge translation uh, uh, to the force. And I think uh, folks like uh, uh, NSERC, uh, you know, presidents and uh, Mona Niemer and uh, many others, you know, have been uh, very much uh, uh, enthusiastically uh, participating in your programs, you know, and uh, so uh, congratulations again. Um, uh, 100th episode, right? Now 101 is coming up. So this is fantastic. And uh, so, um, uh, so for folks, uh, if you have questions, please use Q&A feature or raise hand, we can actually bring you into the conversation. Maybe I can uh, get started. You know, the results are uh, really impressive, you know, in that uh, the gold and the combination with the peptide. And uh, so I know you're working on the mechanism at the moment. Uh, do you have any idea, uh, I guess, uh, in terms of where, uh, I know some of them, you know, does end up in the local uh, lymph nodes, but, uh, you know, in terms of, uh, in the myocardium, are they in the interstitium or are they in the uh, mouse sites or are they in the fibroblast, uh, you know, as a, a clue? Because I have a kind of a follow-up question as to, you know, what uh, could be a mechanism, yeah. So we tried to do cryo TM, but it, we don't have facilities in here in Oro, of course, we had to send it to Mac. And uh, we have some data, but the issue with the cryo, even from the technician, uh, it is really difficult to see the size of the particles we have. We have particles of 20 nanometers or even 10 nanometers or super tiny. Um, even we're pushing their boundaries. So I mean, we have some evidence that are, that are within actually the cardiac muscle. Mm. Uh, a specific area is not really well defined, but they're somehow in the outer portion of the cells that are not fully integrated. But again, I mean, this was from one of the sections that uh, she, she located and, and she was really honest with us. And like with this, I think that we don't have the capabilities in Canada probably to do this. So you will have to send it to the States. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, the one thing we know is that uh, the concentration we're using, Peter, is a thousand times lower than the, any concentration that reported in the literature. And I think that the advantage in here is that we don't do intra, you know, intravenous injection, we don't do intramyocardial injection, use the coding of the heart. Mm -hmm. And with this small volume, and, and I think that was one of the things that really attracted the interest of the editor at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think the safety aspect, you know, is a real advantage here. Uh, you know, before I ask uh, kind of my follow up question, drop in this does have, uh, you know, one is a comment, you know, in terms of the great uh, quality of the work. Uh, he had a question in terms of uh, uh, whether any of these particles are visualizable, for example, on CT or MR or PET. I think there is a way to do it. Uh, with if you do a coding with uh, with um, with iron or something like that, or if we use one of the probes from from BEM maybe, uh, but the key here is that the concentration is so low that it will be trial and error. But uh, but that is the beauty. I mean, in, in, from my point of view, that the beauty is that that uh, compared to the cardiac patch, <laughs> even I tried to to actually suture once and it was it didn't actually go very well. <laughs> so. Uh, you have to really skill, and in this case, it's uses spraying, and, and and that's fairly innocuous to me. Yeah, so I agree. I think uh, the concentration, uh, even though it's gold, but it's uh, a concentration is probably at least two orders of magnitude, you know, lower than detectable, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, with uh, with uh, MR, for example, or any of these uh, tools, oh, or CT, sorry, uh, but. Uh, uh, but, you know, in the future, maybe uh, some kind of a pet uh, uh, tag or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's, a, you know, that's an excellent uh, question. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So, so Rob was asking about, you know, possibly tagging with uh, some mm -hmm. isotope that uh, could be detectable, mm -hmm. would be uh, opportunistic. Yeah, I agree. And uh, so my follow-up question is, uh, you know, and it's really fascinating in terms of the mechanisms. And I wondered whether the combination of the gold, uh, you know, because gold is otherwise inert. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, it, it's gold is otherwise uh, uh, inert, but uh, it may actually have uh, these, uh, you know, sort of attracting properties, right? You know, it uh, uh, may um, actually bring uh, some of the uh, peptides in uh, specific configurations. And, uh, and uh, it seemed to me that uh, this combination has some androgenic properties. You know, it makes me think that uh, it may actually shift uh, the, um, uh, you know, the inflammatory cells are very, very active in this type of setting. And uh, so, you know, there is the pro-inflammatory and also the, the healing components. And uh, that uh, this may actually trigger, you know, some of those uh, uh, inflammatory signals, you know, that particularly promotes uh, angiogenesis. And uh, is that... Uh, uh, something that uh, is uh, possible, or has there been any uh, work done on this before? So th there is literature reporting that yeah. lower concentration of gold they are anti-inflammatory. Uh, but the, when yes. when you're looking at the actual papers, Peter, uh, all honesty here, uh, the mechanisms are really like not by a mechanistic person, so they're really like looking into pathways that define. Mm -hmm. And um, with with Eric, when we decide just to 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 push this without the mechanisms because we know that we will need someone in mechanisms yeah. <laughs> and lots of money. Right. Yeah. But but it is interesting and, and I think that uh, I'm inclined to think that something is triggered by the goal, maybe the goal release is low mm -hmm. concentration of gold ions yeah. that is happening just in the right place at the right moment. Mm -hmm. And that might actually be, you know, either acting as a free radical scavenger because of the oxidative environment and preventing the infiltration of additional, you know, uh, 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 pro-inflammatory macrophages, yes, yes. but uh, but that's one of the species. I mean, yeah. we tried to run uh, some uh, inflammatory profile markers in the blood, and we didn't see much of a difference, you know, early time points. So I think that what is happening here is that the the the, the goal has to be uptake before mm -hmm. do anything, and that is when you you will see the biological effect. Yeah, okay, so that's uh, fantastic. Yeah, because I think uh, uh, certainly uh, we can assemble a kind of a, uh, a team of experts who can actually, you know, help you to um, uh, also, you know, explore that aspect simply because the model is so uh, 
you know, so impressive. Yeah. And uh, so, so what's uh, next for this, you know, because you actually have some really interesting uh, tools in place. Is it possible to actually combine, you know, sort of some of the tools, uh, you know, on the gold aspect, you know, in terms of inflammation, but at the same time, you know, you're working on materials that can minimize scar. And, you know, so there are a lot of a kind of a cross, uh, uh, and of course, you know, I have some of the 3D printed, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, um, uh, scar repair, um, you know, tools. Uh, could these things uh, down the road uh, be uh, hybridized? I don't know what the word is. <laughs> I, I you know, think to maximize the, the functionality I, I think or that stage. The, I think yeah. that the use of, of these peptides as a really low concentration, it would be interesting to see, for example, combined with uh, the spray on, but no nanoparticle, nanoparticle, but you can combine with the, you know, soft particles, something that, the, yes. you know, you can engineer the surface yeah. to deliver something that you want to be prevented from the enzymatic degradation, so encapsulated. I think the injection is good. But uh, but in my head, uh, I, I would like to see this eventually coupled to these uh, new robots that are launching now in the States. Mm -hmm. I can't remember the name, but this is a robot that you put on the cardiac muscle and it's able to actually walk through, like mm -hmm. on the cardiac muscle. Mm -hmm. And just doing the spray there, because it's a minimum pressure, it's just doing a spray on different points and then trying to see what happens. Yeah. Um, I think that would be interesting to see. Um, I, I think that the goal, it was something that we did it mainly for curiosity, to be honest with you, Peter. Uh, and we, in the hope that let's see what happened. And, but the concept of a spraying on the heart, it might actually be in something worth exploring in the future uh, for other applications. It doesn't need to be gold, right? It can be like, you know, soft panel particles, mRNA, whatever thing you want to deliver in there, because we found a peptide that is able to really anchor fairly, fairly well. Yeah, so I think the, the degree of application, right, you know, is really uh, uh, potentially way beyond the, the current, uh, you know, example. Uh, so yeah, so I think it's really uh, the ability to uh, incorporate, uh, you know, sort of multiple other type of uh, solutions, right, you know, to customize. I think the key here you know, the ability to actually customize to the need uh, at uh, the uh, uh, time of injury or, or even, you know, sort of uh, other settings uh, will be so, uh, so exciting. Yeah. Uh, so, yes. So are there Dr. other Lou? questions? Yes. Dr. Liu, we do have a question uh, in the uh, comments with a, with a hands up. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I can't see uh, any of that. Uh, what's the best way for me to do that? Yeah. Because I, I, I don't see that in the screen. Um, uh, so, uh, so who is, uh, uh, yeah, so I apologize. I can't actually engage. Uh, I think it's Jan Yu, is that right? Yeah, that's right. So yeah, Jan Yu, ahead. are you, uh, now are you able to unmute Jan Yu? Yes, yeah. you should be able to hear me, right? Okay. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so I see you now. Yes, John, yeah. you are in the system. Yeah, so go ahead and ask the question, please. Yeah, I'm Jane Yu Li from McGill, and yeah, I think excellent talk, very inspiring. Uh, yeah, my lab is working on bioadhesive, so I have a question regarding right those delivered nanoparticle on the heart, whether or not you were also kind of attached to other part of the tissue. Uh, did you see that in the animal experiment, and do you think it's a big uh, issue to address? Hi, you do. Um, congratulations again. Um, so um, that's a good question. I, I think that um, if you look at the structure one we engineered, and I was going to actually send an email to you, by the way, um, we have additional arms, right? So, and that is a nice point for doing additional chemistry there. And uh, we're thinking now doing some click chemistry rather than free radical chemistry polymerization. But, uh, but you can do that. I mean, um, I think this is, uh, is somehow like a dendrimer-like structure that it work at least in the animal, in the, in the cardiac muscle of the small animal. Um, I, have, I, don't, I don't see why not it should work in, in even pig's hearts, but it's something that we need to test. But as an anchoring point is, is ideal, but, uh, but structurally, when you're looking at the design of the chemistry we use, what we wanted to do in the past when we were naive, naive. <laughs> so we, we engineered to have it a photosensitive layer. So to try to do an additional coating, right? Because we were expecting this just to have a stabilization effect in the cardiac function. 
So we say, okay, we need something more to, to provide a mechanical support. But it turned out that it was used, it, it wasn't needed, but certainly for engineering of repair of internal organs, uh, you will need something else, an additional layer. And that is when I was going to send you an email to, hmm. to start thinking about that. <laughs> Great, thank you. Maybe you can kind of spray it the second time, right? Just to have another yes. layer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank uh, you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, so that, yeah, thanks for that question. That's kind of what I was thinking earlier, you know, in terms of uh, being able to combine these different uh, solutions, uh, you know, in terms of needs. Yeah, so that's wonderful. Yeah, so thanks for that question. And, uh, you know, uh, and uh, uh, if it can foster collaboration, I'd be even better. Yeah. Uh, are there other questions? Um, if not, then I just uh, like to uh, thank Emilio again, you know, for, uh, you know, really what uh, eye opening uh, type of uh, uh, presentation and of course this is only just a small part of uh, all the other things that uh, he's uh, doing and the uh, party that's why I asked uh, these questions but it's just a uh, uh, fantastic in terms of the ability to actually you know sort of uh, uh, probe biology you know in these uh, type of settings and uh, so really um, uh, appreciate the uh, update and uh, and keep up with the uh, you know sort of uh, amazing uh, you know sort of uh, multifunctional lab that you have. And of course, also all the other activities that you have, including the Beats Radio, which we are most uh, appreciative and it's really uh, giving the Heart Institute, but also science in general, you know, fantastic impact from knowledge translation uh, point of view. Yeah, so um, so uh, so this is uh, really exciting. And uh, I think everybody's, uh, you know, sort of uh, more uh, inspired by all this uh, uh, advancements that the one can actually apply. You know to our patients and uh, so uh, you know look forward to additional uh, 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 work from you and also your beats radio coming up and for our uh, work uh, 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 in terms of the uh, research uh, progress session uh, the next one will be on January 31st and it's uh, going to be presented by Arvind Mayer and then the topic is going to be on machine learning for precision medicine. So look forward to uh, everybody joining us at that time. Yeah, so thanks again, Emilio and all your team uh, for the excellent work. Yeah, so 